Where is your mind this morning? Where is your heart this morning? Is it in the past in um, maybe a tough thing that you're going through? Is your mind somewhere else? You see, every day, um, you know, in Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough issues of its own. Focus on today, right? There's enough in today to focus on, and I wonder that's even true with our past. But are, is there something in your future that you're concerned about? Did something happen this, this past couple days that was unfortunate, to say the least? What was comforting for me is that no matter what, has happened or will happen, it's where I am right now, there's no better place that I could be. Amen. This morning, we are continuing our series in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we will be focusing in verses 12 through 16. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Again, we will be focusing... And verses 12 through 16. In the book, What's So Amazing About Grace, the author, Christian author, Philip Yancey, recounts this story about renowned theologian and scholar C.S. Lewis. He writes, During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities incarnation. Other religions had different versions of gods appearing in human form. Resurrection. Again, other religions had recounts of different, of uh, return from death. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about? He asked and heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. Lewis responded, Oh, that's easy. It's grace. After some discussion, the conferees had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. The Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu Doctrine of Karma, the Jewish Covenant, and Muslim Code of Law. Each of these offers a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Amen. As we begin this morning, this will be our focus today. That there are two important stages in every person's life. Everyone in this room has two very important stages that they will experience in this life. The first stage, who we are before we encounter Jesus as Savior. Who we are before we come in some sort of encounter with Jesus Christ. Let's read 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 16 before we move any further. Paul writes to Timothy, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy, and deserving a full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But again, I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So as, we, as Paul is writing in this portion of Timothy uh, chapter 1, He talks about his life before salvation. Those of you who don't know, it says Saul up there. That's not a typo. Um, Paul was originally named Saul before he came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So in verse 13, Paul shares his, if you will, unsightly resume with Timothy. 
we see number one, he states, he is a blasphemer. And in the Greek, that means that it's a, a blasphemer is a person who just defames someone, a person who is publicly against somebody else, a slanderer, if you will, a gossip, um, but to the highest extreme. So Paul is saying, I was a blasphemer in terms of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Secondly, he was a persecutor. He was a person who engaged in persecuting others. And it goes so far to say that it was a habit of his, this form of the word, to persecute. It wasn't a one-time or a two-time deal. It was a, a, a cons- it was a consistency in his lifestyle. And number three, he says that he was an insolent opponent, which means that he was insulting in an arrogant manner. You see, what Paul is really saying is that even though in the past I was a person who spoke evil of him and persecuted him and insulted him, I received mercy. Saul's persecution of Jesus Christ, what does he mean when he said, I I persecuted him, I was an insolent opponent? Well, fortunately, God's word gives us some background, some details into what Paul is referring to in this letter. First in Acts 1a, it says that, And Saul approved of his, and that is Stephen's, execution. In Acts, uh, the end of Acts chapter 7, going into Acts 8, um, Stephen was one of the um, early converts in Christianity at this transition period in the book of Acts between the apostles' ministry and the mystery revealed to the apostle Paul in this dispensation that we're in today, the dispensation of grace. And Stephen um, gave a renowned, powerful, biblically-based sermon to the Jewish council, and they, they had none of it. They rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Messiah, and because of that, they stoned him to death. And in Acts 8, Paul says, or Luke recounts that Paul approved of this execution And this was one of the last straws that God had with the nation of Israel at that time. So this was a big deal that Saul was not only there, Paul, but that he was a part of that in terms of that approval. And in Acts 8.3, it says that, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So right after this execution of Stephen, Paul was ravaging homes. He was taking men, women, and even their children, those who were a part of the way, which was Christianity um, at that time, the early stages of Christianity, he, and he had no mercy on them whatsoever. And in Acts 26.10, this is Paul recollecting back to his life before Christ, and he's before um, Agrippa, uh, a governmental leader, and he says, And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. You see, it was clear, and God's word makes it clear, that Saul was no no saint uh, before he came to know Jesus Christ and that encounter that he had on the road to Damascus. He was, as he says, you know, Christ came to the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Um, So the point that I'm trying to make is that, and that I will make again throughout this message, is that no matter what you've done, God's grace and God's love is not, will always reach you where you're at, no matter what. So man's status to use that word, before salvation. This is what Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians chapter 2. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is not at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And the reason I have that last portion underlined is because, you know, um, those of you who maybe have a similar background to myself is at the age of five, I came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And so I, you know, zero, you know, born to age five, 
you may not be an insolent opponent of Jesus Christ, right? And yet, by my very nature, as Paul says here, I was a children, a, a child of wrath. And so it, there's no level of sin, um, beloved. It's, sin is sin. We're born into this world, and we're born into sin when we come into this world, and we're all in the same boat. In the Christian Medical Society Journal, uh, in the winter 1978 edition, one man said to his friend, this is a story from this journal, one man said to his friend, Say, you look depressed. What are you thinking about? My future, was the quick answer. What makes it look so hopeless? The man responded, My past. (laughs) How are you handling your past? You see, there are two options in how we can handle our past, how we can look at and view our past as we continue to live our life. There are two options. First option is to live or to dwell in the past. And quite frankly, as I look at God's word, I I consider, you know, if I were to adopt this option of living or dwelling in the past, quite frankly, it goes in direct opposition of the gospel. Did you know that? If you live or dwell in the past, you're going against what God's word says. You see, in Titus 1, 2, uh, it says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised us. The hope of eternal life. We who have a hope of eternal life have no reason to dwell or worry about our past because our future is that we have a hope that one day we will have a glorified body and we will be with the Lord forever in heaven. Ephesians 1.18, Paul says, I pray so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The riches of the glory of his inheritance that we share as saints in Jesus Christ. 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. You see, our past before we received God's free gift of salvation, was death. That was our future, not just a physical death, which we all will experience, but a spiritual death, an eternal separation from God. But that's in our past when we have received salvation. So why are we dwelling in that? Just a challenge I have for you this morning. As we continue through 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 16, There's a second option, and we find it in this passage, and it's Paul's example. How does Paul look at his past? How does he view his past? Well, if you will turn briefly to Philippians chapter 3, or I'll have it up here, maybe on the screen. I do not have it on the screen. Uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 15. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. You see, Paul says, I don't dwell in the past, but I look on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize of the upward call of God is what he calls it. Straining forward, focusing forward on what does God have for you? What is God's plan for you? And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, Paul writes, Give thanks in all circumstances for this It's the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You see, people ask all the time, you know, Pastor, what? I just want to know the will of God for my life. What is the will of God? If I could just know exactly what that is, cut and dry, I'll do it, no problem. Well, this is one example where Paul says, this is the will of God, to give thanks in every circumstance, every season of life. And that includes our past. Amen? Give thanks, for that is the will of God for you. Are you giving thanks for your past? 
those things that maybe you had to learn the hard way. But are you giving thanks for the lesson maybe that God taught you through that? You see, our past is important because it illustrates what God, what God has done for us. And when, when we can compare that to our life today, it, at least for me, it's a humbling experience because I wouldn't be here this morning without Jesus Christ. So the first stage that we talked about in every person's life is who we are before we encounter Jesus Christ. We are a child of wrath. We are dead in our trans- transpasses, transgressions and sins. Right? It's clear, for the wages of sin is death, right? Romans three twenty three. But the good news is that's not the end. That's not where our story can end if we accept Jesus Christ. So, that's, so what is the second stage, you may be wondering. I hope you're wondering. <laughs> it is who we become after we encounter Jesus as Savior. Who we become. And that's a very important word. Because as you know, that when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord, when we receive his free gift of salvation, as Paul says, we become a new creation, right? So it literally is a becoming, a transformation within us. So who we become after we encounter Jesus Christ? Well, how does this relate back to our 1 Timothy passage? Well, you see, in verse 12, Paul says, He judged me faithful. And this word, faithful, bear with me here I'm so used to technology that you know I just want to click it over here or click it over here and it should work right but it's not so well faithful means trustworthy dependable reliable so he is saying that God viewed me he examined me he examined my heart and my mind and he found that I was found to be trustworthy dependable and reliable You see, Paul was someone the Lord could place his full confidence in the task that Jesus Christ had for him. The very important task, right? When we know the rest of Paul's story and ministry. And this will become an important principle in Paul's ministry because in 2 Timothy 2.2, in his second letter to Timothy, Paul writes, pass on these words that I give to you to reliable men. That is, to faithful men. It's the same word here. In 2 Timothy 2.11, he says, This is a saying that we can have confidence in or that we can trust. So you see, this this concept of faithfulness or being trustworthy or dependable or reliable will be very important to Paul. And Paul is saying that God viewed me this way. You see, God views you, he judges you as trustworthy and dependable. And because of that, he has a purpose for your life. It doesn't have to be as a pastor or a missionary or a a camp director, right? It could be in the medical field or or in law or in um, business, whatever that may be. uh, Staying at home and supporting your family, taking care of them, raising them up. You see, God has a unique purpose for your life and he views you as faithful. Well, how can this be? How, after we talked about uh, Paul's uh, horrendous resume right coming into this um, before his encounter with Jesus Christ how can he be viewed as faithful well if we look back at Philippians chapter 3 and I'll turn there very briefly and this is what he says in Philippians 3 verses 1 through 6 he says finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you look out for the dogs Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And he goes on to say, but but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You see, as Paul wrote there, he had every reason to boast 
in his in his pedigree, right? He was zealous for the law, which means he he had a hunger, he had a thirst for knowing the things of God and knowing his commandments for his people Israel. Saul's pedigree, as he said, was probably better than most of us may have. And yet, he said, I counted it all as loss. In verse 12, we continue. He says, God appointed me to his service. He appointed me to his service. And the word service in the Greek is diakonia, which simply means ministry. And this word for ministry refers to lowly, humble service. See, Paul is not boasting, saying that this ministry or this service that I have is, you know, better than anybody else's. No, he's saying this humbly because this service, as you know, Paul many times identifies himself. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a slave, literally, for Jesus Christ. So Paul does not view his ministry as a boasting experience, but he's keeping himself in check, if you will. So we are appointed to the service of the Lord, but I wonder with the world that we live in today and the, the messages that the world projects to us or broadcasts to us that we sometimes compare our friends and neighbors and their career paths to our service for the Lord and say, man, you know, I, I love the Lord. I love Jesus Christ. I love his word. I 100% agree with what God's word says. But I wonder deep down sometimes if we're maybe a little ashamed or disappointed maybe is a better word disappointed with maybe the ministry that we feel like God is calling us to because if you look at the apostle Paul he had a tremendous impact for the body of Christ and for spreading the gospel to the rest of the world and yet if you look at his life he didn't have riches he didn't have fame or glory or honor he always deflected that to Jesus Christ so I wonder what our mentality is this morning when we view ourselves as being appointed to his service and maybe what, you know, as Pastor Les was preaching on a few weeks ago, sifting out the facts that were given and say, what is truth? Well, the truth is that we were appointed to his service and that is more honorable than the world could ever understand. But we can understand it because we have God's word and we have his spirit illuminating to us what that really means. The second step of who we become when we, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as Paul says, is God's mercy. Two times, Paul says in this portion of 1 Timothy 1, that he says, I received mercy. Twice he says that. Well, in Merriam-Webster, for those of you who are interested, to receive means to come into possession of or to acquire so Paul is saying, I came into possession of God's mercy. It was not something that was already a part of his life. But God gave that to him. It was a gift from God. And as we receive salvation, which is a free gift of God, we also will receive God's mercy, which is not what we deserve, right? But it's something that Paul says is an integral part of our new relationship with Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians 2, 4, Paul says, but God being rich in mercy. You see, mercy is not something that God lacks in how much he, how much he has. It's daily given in, in abundance. In abundance. The third aspect of, or work, if you will, when we become a new believer, a new saint in Jesus Christ, uh, Paul talks about here is the grace of our Lord. Right? In verse... Um, 14 he says and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus you see uh, as I was doing my study I learned that no other system of religious thought past or present contains an emphasis on divine grace comparable to that of the Bible and we learned that right in that story from Philip Yancey that no other religion has even a any inch of the same amount of focus on grace that Christianity has in terms of God's relationship to mankind. No other religion. And this is Paul's only mention of grace, this verse in this portion of the passage. The only mention, and yet grace is the underlying theme of the passage, right? Because it was only by God's grace and mercy that Paul could be 
doing the ministry that God appointed him to do. And when he says, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me, he's saying, literally saying that God's grace was not only more than enough for what I needed, but it was very, very much. You know, it's kind of like when you're a little kid and and uh, or yeah you're a little kid and you're going to pour a, a glass of milk right and you pour and maybe the gallon for me when I was a kid was kind of too heavy so I was always kind of kind of worried about it and I pour and pour and the milk you know goes way more than over the top and goes on the counter and I know they say don't cry about spilled milk but sometimes I did want to cry because I knew that if my dad saw me he probably wouldn't be too happy with that but that's what Paul is talking about is I didn't just have enough grace for what I needed to to complete the job of becoming a Christian but that his grace was more than enough. Are you experiencing that in your life? I like what Lee Strobel says. He says, all we needed when we first came to Jesus was his grace. And grace is all we need to grow in Jesus Christ. Grace liberates us. Our tendency toward performance, that imprisons us. You see, those other religions, the Buddhist Eightfold Path and Karma and all of those things, the Muslim uh, Code of Law or whatever that was called, all those things, the aim is performance. And yet the more we try to perform for God, the more we're going to fail. Because as the Bible says, all of our good deeds are like filthy rags, right? Only by God's grace are we allowed to do things for the Lord. Only by His grace. And he continues in verse 14, and he says, And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In high school, I was really good at English and really enjoyed it. But the, you know, a big, obviously, aspect of English is grammar, right? Well, I was good at grammar in some ways, but I just never really enjoyed studying grammar, you know, I, we, we, we had the Shirley method in my fourth grade, and, and simply what that was is, for some reason, this Shirley character, and I use that word intentionally, thought that in order for a child to learn grammar, they had to sing jingles about grammar, you know? So, you know, preposition, preposition, starting with a P, or starting with an A, a board, about, above, along, you know, I, I don't want to continue, and I can't, thank the Lord, you wouldn't want me to. And obviously, you can see I'm looking back in my past joyfully, um, but, the, but grammar is a, obviously a big part of English. And even so, when we read scripture, that when you look at the grammar, especially when, if you're able to study the Greek um, original biblical text, it's very important, as Pastor Les would agree, that you know, prepositions and you know, like the word but is a very important contrast of what the author is saying. And here, in this uh, in verse, the end of verse 14, Paul is saying, with the faith and love, with is a preposition. I was able to remember that from fourth grade, which is good. And he says, with the faith and love. The word with in Greek is meta, which is a marker of the experiencer of an event with the added implication of association. I don't expect you to remember that, but it's important that when meta is used in the Greek, with, there's an added importance of association. So what Paul is saying is that the grace of our Lord overflowed simultaneously at the same time with faith and love. You see, the grace of our Lord, more often than not, will always be accompanied with faith and love. And that's important to understand that God's grace is not something he just gives, but he gives that in love, and he gives that with faith as well. And he, and he ends the verse with, that are in Christ Jesus. What he's saying with the word in there in the Greek is that the faith and love that are in union with or that are joined closely to Christ Jesus. So these things, grace, faith, and love that are overflowing for Paul and his experience are literally a part of Jesus Christ's nature. That when you go to the throne of God, when you, when you give your prayers to Jesus Christ, his nature is literally Part of his nature is literally grace, faith, and love. And so he lavishes those things upon you because that's the very nature of who he is. And that is what Paul is illustrating to Timothy right now.
So we have God's mercy. We have God's grace. And the third aspect or third work that Paul talks about is that you're delivered, right? He says in verse 15, the saying is trustworthy or is faithful again, reliable and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. You see, that's the key of this verse. That's the key, one of the keys of this passage that the main purpose why Jesus Christ came into the world was not just to display the almighty power of God. No, it was to save sinners. It was to save you and me. And when we do that, when we accept Jesus' free gift of salvation, you are delivered from your past. You no longer are in death, but you have passed from death into life. And I was so thankful to be a part of that time yesterday morning with Pastor Les and Kirsten because she experienced this. She experienced God's mercy in that moment, and she was delivered from her sin. You see, all of us have sin in our past that we have to take care of, and yet that doesn't, it's not really true in terms of saying that way because we can't take care of it ourselves. Only Jesus Christ's blood on the cross can do that, and yet the ball is in our court. You have the sin in your life. You heard about this man, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, and his blood covered your sin. You, you, you may know that up here. So you have these two sides of the coin here, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do about your sin? How are you going to take care of that? That's what Pastor Les had to ask Kirsten yesterday. What are you going to do about your sin? It's one thing to believe in God, believe there is a God, believe there is a Jesus Christ, believe the Bible is his word. But that's not what the Bible says you have to do. It has to be in your heart. And when you do that, when you come to that place, you are delivered from your sin. It's powerful stuff. See, Paul goes on to say that he is an example for Timothy and for for many of us even still today. He says, But I received mercy, in verse 16, for this reason. You see, it was not merely for you know fire insurance or to write theological letters that Paul was saved. You see, God's mercy shown to Paul was primarily for God's glory and secondarily for Paul's benefit. Primarily, as Paul was illustrating here, that it was for God's glory that Paul was saved. But the second part, his benefit was still just as important because he goes on to say that Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. And this perfect patience in some languages is to keep one's heart from jumping or to have a waiting heart. See, God has a waiting heart for you and for those who have yet to call on his name for salvation. If God was patient with the worst of sinners, as Paul calls himself. How can we think that anyone else is beyond God's saving grace? Right? Something to think about. He goes on to say in verse 16 that Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience to be an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. Paul's testimony was living proof that God can save any sinner. And this word example is that he was literally, he's literally saying in the Greek that I was the model or the type or the pattern for those who were to become, to, or, who were later be delivered from their sin. You know, I'm one that, that I can very easily say that my testimony is not something that maybe Hollywood would want to pick up and make a movie about. Okay, I wasn't a drug dealer. I wasn't in prison. I wasn't a mass murderer. I wasn't a high-rolling gambler in Las Vegas. Nothing exciting about my, my past in that regard. But praise the Lord, right? But as we saw in Paul's words, I was still, in my nature, a child of wrath. I still had just as much sin in my life as the as people that have that kind of a background. And yet I 
sometimes in my past, you know, when I was younger, I was like, man, you know, I don't really want to get up and share my testimony because my buddy Jimmy next to me has a much more interesting story. I'd rather him share the story and, and because God's glory will be given much, that much more because of what God, how God delivered him from his past and what he was going through. My dad's a pastor. Like, of course I'm going to become a Christian, right? You know, well, frankly, that's not always the case. But I hope you can understand that's what our mentality can be is that, you know, God, don't, don't use me, God. Like, I appreciate you reaching out to me and saying, hey, bud, I really want to use you for my glory. But, but God, you, you saved me when I was five years old. Like, what possibly can you do? How can I possibly persuade someone or get someone to really consider becoming a Christian? Well, the same power the same blood that saved me saves those people. And, I, and the people that have a similar background as myself are relatable then to my past, right? All of our pasts, I wouldn't say we don't make mistakes on purpose, right? And God doesn't have us make mistakes so he can use those. But when we do make mistakes when we, or when we do sin or when we do make decisions that we look back and say, I shouldn't have made that decision, God can use those in the future, because your past may be very similar to somebody else's past. And because of that, you can naturally build rapport with them. And because you can build rapport with them, they may be more willing to hear the gospel. But they may be more willing to hear the gospel from you than they would be to hear the gospel from me because they may not be able to relate to my past. But what does your past look like? Who can relate to your past? I hope we'll think about that as we leave here this morning. If you fear God cannot save you, which is a, a valid fear. I, I've known people that have that, that have that fear. If you fear God, that you've, your past is too bad, that God cannot save you, consider Paul's testimony. Consider Paul's testimony. He has something to say about that. Stephen's in the back. I was hoping he would be here to hear this illustration, but that's okay. The sailor's home in Liverpool was once on fire at night, and a great cry of fire was raised. When the people assembled, they saw in the upper story some men crying for help. The fire escape did not nearly reach where the men were. A long ladder was brought and put against the burning building, but it was too short. A British sailor in the crowd soon rushed up the ladder, balanced himself on the uppermost round with his foot, and seized the windowsill with his hands, and shouted, Quick, men, scramble over my body, on the ladder, and down you go. One by one, the men came down until all were saved. And then the sailor came down, his face burnt, his hair singed, and his fingers blistered. But he had saved every man. That ladder went a long way, but before the men could be saved, it needed the length of a man. The length of a man. You see, there is a gap between God and you and I. And there is no ladder in the world that could reach us to God, that could fill the gap between us. And as you see up there, it's because of sin in the world that we have this broken relationship with God, our Creator. But the truth of God's Word, the Gospel, the good news of God's Word is that it doesn't have to be this way. You see, people try good works. They try religions. They try philosophy. They try living a good, moral life. And yet, none of those things fill the gap. Only one thing can fill the gap. And that is Jesus Christ. You see, the length of one man saved you, can save you, and saved me from my sin. The length of one man, Jesus Christ. It took a lot for Jesus Christ to come. I'm sure you, you know, but, but think about that. He had to give up 
his heavenly glory and his position and his status to come into the measly form of man just so that he could save you and then he could save me. You see, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You may not think, you may not think you're too bad. You may think, yeah, Paul, you know, Paul was the worst, but you know, I'm not too bad a guy. You know, I, I live a good life. I, I don't tithe the church, but I give money and I help people when they're, and I see them in need and all these things. But as you saw in that previous picture, none of those things reaches you to God. Only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and believing, accepting that you are our sinner, coming to that realization and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's the only way you will be saved. You see, there are two truths to remember as we read 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. Who we were before we encountered Jesus Christ. Looking back on that as Paul did, not with shame, but saying, this is who I used to be. But because of God's grace, because of his mercy, with faith and love, I was spared from that. I was delivered from that. And secondly, then, the work that Christ has done within you, who we become. You are literally a new creation. You don't have to continue in your, with your old life. You have a clean slate, even still today. Even if you were saved like me at a young age, you still have a, can still have a clean slate to pursue what God has for you. My question for you is, how are you handling your life before Christ? How are you handling your life before you encounter Jesus Christ? Are you dwelling in that past, looking back maybe with shame and grief and, and not wanting to share that with other people, let alone think about it yourself? How are you handling that? I encourage you to share with someone, maybe one person this week, the life-changing work Christ has done for you. Just one person. Say, this is who I was. This is who I used to be. But because of Jesus Christ and his grace, and because of what his son did for me on the cross, I was delivered. And you can be too. It doesn't take wise words. It doesn't say clever speech. But it's preach the cross of Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. How does God want to use you as an example? I don't know your sphere of influence. I may know what you do for, for a career. I may know a part of town you live, but what is your sphere of influence? Who can you make an impact on, especially with your testimony of Jesus Christ? How does God want to use you in that sphere of influence? Think about that. Really pray about that. And if you're already following that, what God has for you, praise the Lord. If you're not, praise the Lord. He can still use you where you are today. As the worship team comes forward, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, like Paul, it, it may be, considering our backgrounds, it may be easy for us to say that I am the worst of sinners, or I know someone who is the worst of sinners, but Christ, but God, praise, praise the Lord that you delivered us from our sin. And that even though we couldn't do anything for our sin, even though we deserved death and eternal separation from you, you sent your only son to take our place, to be the, the proper substitute for our sin. Lord, I pray for those of us in this room that maybe haven't come to that place of knowledge and a relationship with you, Lord, that they would consider what was said today, that they would consider talking with someone maybe that they know that knows you, that they would speak with Pastor Les, or they would speak with myself, or they would speak with uh, Pastor Floyd, or anyone that they can trust and confide in, Lord. I pray that they would consider at the very least what your word says and what your son, Jesus Christ, has done for them on the cross. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, that we will examine our hearts and minds and really ask ourselves, Sure, I believe this, and sure, I have received salvation. I'm fine. I'm a Christian. I'm all good to go. But that's not 
all that you have for us. You've created us to do good works. I pray, Lord, that we will leave this place as a living, walking testimony of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.